Recording by Courtney Sandu. The Christmas Tree and the Wedding by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The other day I saw a wedding, but no, I would rather tell you about a Christmas tree. The wedding was superb. I liked it immensely, but the other incident was still finer. I don't know why it is that the sight of the wedding reminded me of the Christmas tree. This is the way it happened. Exactly five years ago, on New Year's Eve, I was invited to a children's ball by a man high up in the business world who had his connections, his circle of acquaintances, and his intrigues. So it seemed as though the children's ball was merely a pretext for the parents to come together and discuss matters of interest to themselves, quite innocently and casually. I was an outsider, and, as I had no special matters to air, I was able to spend the evening independently of the others. There was another gentleman present, who, like myself, had just stumbled upon this affair of domestic bliss. He was the first to attract my attention. His appearance was not that of a man of birth or high family. He was tall, rather thin, very serious, and well-dressed. Apparently he had no heart for the family festivities. The instant he went off into a corner by himself, the smile disappeared from his face, and his thick dark brows knitted into a frown. He knew no one except the host, and showed every sign of being bored to death, though bravely sustaining the role of thorough enjoyment to the end. Later I learned that he was a provincial, had come to the capital on some important brain-racking business, had brought a letter of recommendation to our host, and our host had taken him under his protection, not at all con amore. It was merely out of politeness that he had invited him to the children's ball. They did not play cards with him. They did not offer him cigars. No one entered into conversation with him. Possibly they recognized the bird by its feathers from a distance. Thus my gentleman, not knowing what to do with his hands, was compelled to spend the evening stroking his whiskers. His whiskers were really fine, but he stroked them so assiduously that one got the feeling that the whiskers had come into the world first and afterwards the man in order to stroke them. There was another guest who interested me, but he was of quite a different order. He was a personage. They called him Julian Mastakovich. At first glance one could tell he was an honored guest, and stood in the same relation to the host as the host to the gentleman of the whiskers. The host and hostess said no end of amiable things to him, were most attentive, whining him, hovering over him, bringing guests up to be introduced, but never leading him to any one else. I noticed tears glistening in our host's eyes when Julian Mastakovich remarked that he had rarely spent such a pleasant evening. Somehow I began to feel uncomfortable in this personage's presence, so after amusing myself with the children, five of whom, remarkably well-fed young persons, were our hosts, I went into a little sitting-room entirely unoccupied, and seated myself at the end that was a conservatory, and took up almost half the room. The children were charming. They absolutely refused to resemble their elders, notwithstanding the efforts of mothers and governesses. In a jiffy, they had denuded the Christmas tree down to the very last suite, and had already succeeded in breaking half of their playthings before they even found out which belonged to whom. One of them was a particularly handsome little lad, dark-eyed, curly-haired, who stubbornly persisted in aiming at me with his wooden gun. But the child that attracted the greatest attention was his sister, a girl of about eleven, lovely as a cupid. She was quiet and thoughtful, with large, full, dreamy eyes. The children had somehow offended her, and she left them and walked into the same room that I had withdrawn into. There she seated herself with her doll in a corner. Her father is an immensely wealthy business man, the guests informed each other in tones of awe. Three hundred thousand roubles set aside for her dowry already. As I turned to look at the group from which I heard this news item issuing, my glance met Julian Mastakovich's. He stood listening to the insipid chatter in an attitude of concentrated attention, with his hands behind his back and his head inclined to one side. All the while I was lost in admiration of the shrewdness our host displayed in the dispensing of the gifts. The little maid of the mini ruby dowry received the handsomest doll and the rest of the gifts were graded in value according to the diminishing scale of the parents' stations in life. 
the last child, a tiny chap of ten, thin, red-haired, freckled, came into possession of a small book of nature stories without illustrations, or even head and tail pieces. He was the governess's child. She was a poor widow, and her little boy, clad in a sorry-looking little nankeen jacket, looked thoroughly crushed and intimidated. He took the book of nature stories and circled slowly about the children's toys. He would have given anything to play with them, but he did not dare to. You could tell he already knew his place. I like to observe children. It is fascinating to watch the individuality in them struggling for self-assertion. I could see that the other children's things had tremendous charm for the red-haired boy, especially a toy theater, in which he was so anxious to take a part that he resolved to fawn upon the other children. He smiled and began to play with them. His one and only apple he handed over to a puffy urchin whose pockets were already crammed with sweets, and he even carried another youngster piggyback, all simply that he might be allowed to stay with the theater. But in a few moments an impudent young person fell on him and gave him a pummeling. He did not dare to cry. The governess came and told him to leave off interfering with the other children's games, and he crept away to the same room the little girl and I were in. She let him sit down beside her, and the two set themselves busily dressing the expensive doll. Almost half an hour passed, and I was nearly dozing off, as I sat there in the conservatory, half listening to the chatter of the red-haired boy and the dowered beauty, when Julian Mastakovich entered suddenly. He had slipped out of the drawing-room under cover of a noisy scene among the children. From my secluded corner it had not escaped my notice that a few moments before he had eagerly been conversing with the rich girl's father, to whom he had only just been introduced. He stood for a while, reflecting and mumbling to himself, as if counting something on his fingers. Three hundred, three hundred, eleven, twelve, thirteen, sixteen. In five years, let's say four percent, five times twelve, sixty. And on these sixty, let us assume that in five years it will amount to, well, four hundred. Hmm. hmm. But the shrewd old fox isn't likely to be satisfied with four percent. He gets eight or ten, even, perhaps. Let's suppose five hundred, five hundred thousand. At least that's sure. Anything above that for pocket money. Hmm. He blew his nose, and was about to leave the room when he spied the girl and stood still. I, behind the plants, escaped his notice. He seemed to me to be quivering with excitement. It must have been his calculations that upset him so. He rubbed his hands and danced from place to place, and kept getting more and more excited. Finally, however, he conquered his emotions and came to a standstill. He cast a determined look at the future bride, and wanted to move toward her, but glanced down first. Then, as if with a guilty conscience, he stepped over to the child on tiptoe, smiling, and bent down and kissed her head. His coming was so unexpected that she uttered a shriek of alarm. "'What are you doing here, dear child?' he whispered, looking around and pinching her cheek. "'We're playing.' "'What, with him?' said Julian Mastakovich, with a look askance at the governess's child. "'You should go into the drawing-room, my lad,' he said to him. The boy remained silent and looked up at the man with wide open eyes. Julian Mastakovich glanced round again cautiously and bent down over the girl. What have you got? A doll, my dear? Yes, sir. The child quailed a little and her brow wrinkled. A doll? And do you know, my dear, what dolls are made of? No, sir, she said weakly and lowered her head. Out of rags, my dear. You, boy, you go back to the drawing-room, to the children, said Julian Mastakovich, looking at the boy sternly. The two children frowned. They caught hold of each other and would not part. And do you know why they gave you the doll? asked Julian Mastakovich, dropping his voice lower and lower. No. Because you were a good, very good little girl this whole week. Saying which, Julian Mastakovich was seized with the paroxysm of agitation. He looked round and said in a tone faint, almost inaudible, with excitement and impatience, "'If I come to visit your parents, will you love me, my dear?'
He tried to kiss the sweet little creature, but the red-haired boy saw that she was on the verge of tears, and he caught her hand and sobbed out loud in sympathy. That enraged the man. "'Go away! Go away! Go back to the other room! To your playmates!' "'I don't want him to! I don't want him to! You go away!' cried the little girl. "'Let him alone! Let him alone!' She was almost weeping. There was a sound of footsteps in the doorway. Julian Mostakovich started and straightened up his respectable body. The red-haired boy was even more alarmed. He let go the girl's hand, sidled along the wall, and escaped through the drawing-room into the dining-room. Not to attract attention, Julian Mostakovich also made for the dining-room. He was red as a lobster. The sight of himself in a mirror seemed to embarrass him. Presumably he was annoyed at his own ardor and impatience. Without due respect to his importance and dignity, his calculation had lured and pricked him to the greedy eagerness of a boy who makes straight for his object. Though this was not as yet an object, it would only be so in five years' time. I followed the worthy man into the dining-room where I witnessed a remarkable play. Julian Mostakovich, all flushed with vexation, venom in his look, began to threaten the red-haired boy. The red-haired boy retreated farther and farther until there was no place left for him to retreat to, and he did not know where to turn in his fright. "'Get out of here! What are you doing here? Get out, I say! You good-for-nothing! Stealing fruit, are you? Oh, so! Stealing fruit! Get out, you freckle-face! Go to your likes!' The frightened child, as a last desperate resort, crawled quickly under the table. His persecutor, completely infuriated, pulled out his large linen handkerchief and used it as a lash to drive the boy out of his position. Here I must remark that Julian Mostakovich was a somewhat corpulent man, heavy, well-fed, puffy-cheeked, with a paunch, and ankles as round as nuts. He perspired and puffed and panted. So strong was his dislike, or was it jealousy, of the child, that he actually began to carry on like a madman. I laughed heartily. Julian Mostakovich turned. He was utterly confused, and for a moment apparently quite oblivious of his immense importance. At that moment, our host appeared in the doorway opposite. The boy crawled out from under the table and wiped his knees and elbows. Julian Mostakovich hastened to carry his handkerchief, which he had been dangling by the corner, to his nose. Our host looked at the three of us rather suspiciously. But like a man who knows the world and can readily adjust himself, he seized upon the opportunity to lay hold of his very valuable guest and get what he wanted out of him. "'Here is the boy I was talking to you about,' he said, indicating the red-haired child. "'I took the liberty of presuming on your goodness in his behalf.' "'Oh,' replied Julian Mostakovich, still not quite master of himself. "'He's my governess's son,' our host continued in a beseeching tone. "'She's a poor creature, the widow of an honest official. "'That's why, if it were possible for you—' "'Impossible! Impossible!' "'Julian Mostakovich cried hastily. "'You must excuse me, Philip Alexevich. "'I really cannot. "'I have made inquiries. "'There are no vacancies, "'and there is a waiting list of ten "'who have a greater right. "'I'm sorry.' "'Too bad,' said our host. "'He's a quiet, unobtrusive child.' "'A very naughty little rascal, I should say,' "'said Julian Mostakovich, wryly. "'Go away, boy. "'Why are you here still? "'Be off with you to the other children.' Unable to control himself, he gave me a sidelong glance. Nor could I control myself. I laughed straight in his face. He turned away and asked our host in tones quite audible to me who that odd young fellow was. They whispered to each other and left the room, disregarding me. I shook with laughter. Then I, too, went to the drawing-room. There the great man, already surrounded by the fathers and mothers, and the host and hostess, had begun to talk eagerly with the lady whom he had just been introduced. The lady held the rich little girl's hand. Julian Mostakovich went into a fulsome praise of her. He waxed ecstatic over the dear child's beauty, her talents, her grace, her excellent breeding, plainly laying himself out to flatter the mother, who listened scarcely able to restrain tears of joy, while the father showed his delight by a gratified smile. The joy was contagious. Everybody shared in it. Even the children were obliged to stop playing so as not to disturb the conversation. The atmosphere was surcharged with awe. I heard the mother of the important little girl, 
touched to her profoundest depths, asked Julian Mastakovich in the choicest language of courtesy, whether he would honor them by coming to see them. I heard Julian Mastakovich accept the invitation with unfeigned enthusiasm. Then the guests scattered decorously to different parts of the room, and I heard them, with veneration in their tones, extol the businessman, the businessman's wife, the businessman's daughter, and especially Julian Mastakovich. Is he married? I asked out loud of an acquaintance of mine standing beside Julian Mastakovich. Julian Mastakovich gave me a venomous look. No, answered my acquaintance, profoundly shocked by my intentional indiscretion. Not long ago, I passed the church of... I was struck by the concourse of people gathered there to witness a wedding. It was a dreary day. A drizzling rain was beginning to come down. I made my way through the throng into the church. The bridegroom was a round, well-fed, pot-bellied little man, very much dressed up. He ran and fussed about and gave orders and arranged things. Finally word was passed that the bride was coming. I pushed through the crowd, and I beheld a marvelous beauty whose first spring was scarcely commencing, but the beauty was pale and sad. She looked distracted. It seemed to me, even, that her eyes were red from recent weeping. The classic severity of every line of her face imparted a particular significance and solemnity to her beauty. But through that severity and solemnity, through the sadness, shone the innocence of a child. There was something inexpressibly naive, unsettled, and young in her features, which, without words, seemed to plead for mercy. They said she was just sixteen years old. I looked at the bridegroom carefully. Suddenly I recognized Julian Mastakovich, whom I had not seen again in all those five years. Then I looked at the bride again. Good God! I made my way as quickly as I could out of the church. I heard gossiping in the crowd about the bride's wealth, about her dowry of five hundred thousand roubles, so and so much for pocket money. Then his calculations were correct, I thought, as I pressed out onto the street. End of The Christmas Tree and the Wedding by Fyodor Dostoevsky Recorded by Courtney Sandu Edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.